Welcome everyone to Presidential Talks, Texts, and Tweets, Consistency and Change in the Rhetoric of the Presidency. I am Stephanie Maringer, Class of 2016 and Assistant Director of um, Regional Programs. I wanna thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, also from uh, our office are my colleagues, Sharon Rice, um, who is the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement and Paul Sealing, Assistant Director of Volunteer Engagement. Um, they will be helping to keep things rolling in the discussion tonight, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, a few notes before we get started and I introduce tonight's um, presenter. Uh, we have a live stream uh, transcript that is rolling as we speak. So if you um, wanted to follow that, there is a link in the top left hand corner of the uh, Zoom screen. Um, there's also a link at the very uh, beginning of this uh, presentation in the chat. Um, this event is also being recorded and we will make it available on our Worcester alumni website in the next one to two weeks. And um, if you wish to engage with tonight's discussion, please type either question or comment in the chat so that we can call on you and we will provide you with the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce uh, tonight's presenter. Denise Bostorf is professor and chair of communication studies here at Worcester where she has taught for the past 26 years. She has published two books, The Presidency and the Rhetoric of Foreign Crisis and Proclaiming the Truman Doctrine, The Cold War Call to Arms, which won the Bruce E. Gronbeck Political Communication Research Award. In addition, she has published more than 30 essays on presidential rhetoric about race, foreign policy, political campaigns, and war, in outlets such as Quarterly Journal of Speech, Presidential Studies Quarterly, and Rhetoric and Public Affairs. Her observations about political rhetoric have also appeared in media outlets like the Chicago Tribune, NPR's Morning Edition, and most recently, Vox. However, Dr. Bostorf says her greatest passion is teaching. Her courses include a range of topics, um, rhetorical criticism, political rhetoric, argumentation, environmental communication, rhetoric and civic engagement, and communication and collective memory. And her classes frequently involve hands-on work where students can apply what they've learned. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bostorf to share her political rhetoric observations. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and also Paul and Sharon for all your work and organizing this event. And, and just thank you to all of you uh, for coming. Uh, it's so nice to see so many people interested in this topic. And it's also especially nice to see a lot of familiar faces, uh, including people who I had in class, it seems like not just that long, all that long ago, really. So I'm gonna share my screen for a good bit of my presentation. And then uh, I, I'll remove my PowerPoint just so that we can have a, a more face to face as much as we can these days a conversation you know after I, I complete that so take me just a moment to get this set up and we should be ready to go I thought maybe I would take just a moment to talk a little bit about voting on campus because I have gotten a couple of inquiries from alum asking, what are we doing you know, on campus in terms of making sure that students at Kyle can vote? Well, as it turns out, we're actually doing quite a number of things. So I wanna talk about this you know, just for a moment. Um, I have uh, an intern, Halen Gifford, uh, who works with the Campus Election Engagement Project. And so she is helping me this semester, even though she's studying remotely uh, from Worcester in Indiana, but what she did was she helped with the setup for tabling so that we could register students to vote, uh, help them fill out uh, their absentee ballot requests, because there's a lot more involved now, disinfecting tables, making sure safety precautions and all those things. And she is the person that I brainstorm with as each week we work about on our communication with students. 
uh, in addition, she's been instrumental in uh, developing some virtual uh, online uh, gatherings uh, for the vice presidential and the presidential debates. And Elizabeth Acevedo is her assistant who's on campus who works for a couple hours a week to help us with kind of the running around that needs to be done. But here are some folks who are doing a lot of the work. And these are just a few of the students who are in my political rhetoric course this semester, a course that a number of you uh, took at one time. In this course, we always have a, a project called the Politics in Action Project, or at least for the last 20 years we have. And in that, students do some type of hands-on work where they apply the concepts they're learning in class to some type of problem related to politics that good communication could help to resolve. And so our big project for this semester has been voter registration and get out the vote. And so uh, while I've been sending out messages along with Halen on a weekly basis to students and then also to faculty and staff pretty regularly, these students have been working on tabling, but also on posters and a lot of social media messages. These are just a few of the things that they've created this semester. Uh, we had one group who's trying in particular to target students of color and white allies. And so you can see an Instagram post uh, that they had for voter registration in the, in the top left-hand corner there. Another group was working with athletics. And so they're sending out messages on a lot of the social media networks for our athletes. Uh, this one at the top, first time, let us give you a tip, use protection, request your absentee ballot. This was a group uh, that is working with our first year students with the idea that not only is it a first presidential election like it is for all students on campus, but it's probably the first time they've ever voted. And so giving them some additional uh, information and attention. We have a group that's working on voter information. So you'll see a video that's down at the bottom about how to successfully fill out an absentee ballot to vote in Wayne County. And then an Instagram post that someone else did about how to request an absentee ballot. And we're continuing now with um, other information about where to put your request. You know, we've got the virtual watch party. And also, if you see on the top right-hand side, we've got one group who's really voted, working on sending out information about candidates other than the president, <laughs> because pretty much people have made up their minds on that one. But students may not know much about who is running for the congressional district or who's running for various judgeships or what the local ballot issue for uh, renewal on uh, developmental disabilities, what does that mean? So all of this has been going on to give you a little bit of a, a notion. And as I told students with things constantly changing on campus, uh, they have gotten a little bit of a sense of how on a campaign you can do a lot of work. They had planned, for example, to have a walking to the polls for Halloween uh, that we had to, to cancel uh, because of you know, various events with health related issues. So you know, it's learning how to be uh, you know, creative, but also you know, working on your feet. So that's something they definitely have been doing you know, this semester. With that said, um, I'd like to move to what the topic and the reason why uh, you came which is to talk about this idea of presidential talks, texts, and tweets, you know, consistency and change in presidential rhetoric. And there's so many things I could talk about, so many things. But what I decided tonight was just to focus on a couple of themes where I'm seeing changes over time. And sometimes, especially with our most recent president, you know, we're not sure how long some of the, the changes with him will, will stay. Uh, but also there's still some consistency with some of the other changes, even with him as different of a kind of president as he has been. So let me begin by talking about the move to the visual. A lot of times when I tell people that presidential rhetoric has moved to the visual, sometimes they'll think, oh yeah, John Kennedy, because he was doing, you know, he looked much better than Richard Nixon in, in the debates in 1960, and he did all of these televised press conferences and things like that. But actually the person I would give the most credit for this move to the visual is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, of course, had been an actor and he had Mike Deaver, who was his kind of right-hand person when it came to communication. And they both were very, very good at knowing how it can be so important to not only think about what you're saying, but where you're saying it, uh, what the lighting is like, you know, uh, who's going to be around you, all of those sorts of things. So, and you could see this from the very beginning with his inaugural address. His inaugural address took place, oops, for some reason here, it doesn't want to go forward. Give me just a minute here. Oh, 
there we go. Um, for some, uh, so when he was uh, when he was inaugurated, it was on the western side of the White House, and that was the first time that that had happened. But uh, some people say, oh, he decided to do that. He didn't actually. Uh, as it turns out, that was a decision that had already been made for cost. Uh, saving measures and for crowds because they could use the terrace for people and also the mall would provide more room for audiences. However, what he and his speechwriters did very well was to work with that fact. So in his speech, he referred to uh, the various monuments that one could see from where they were posted. And so when he referred to the Jefferson Memorial, you could see the Jefferson Memorial because the cameras would naturally pan there. When he talked about the Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument or about the sacrifice of our hero heroes who are buried on the rolling hills of Arlington Cemetery, the cameras would naturally go there because TV loves pictures. They love visuals. And that is what he provided. Another example that always sticks in my mind, one of his probably most famous speeches, was this one that he gave on the 40th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. And long before they went there to give the speech, they were already figuring out where he was going to stand, what time of day it would be, what the lighting would be like, what might be the possible weather conditions, and so on. And so when he was talking about the windswept point, you could see that you know, behind him. When he talked about the, the boys of Point de Hoc, these are the men who took the cliffs, they're the champions who helped to free a continent, the heroes who helped to end a war, they're right there and you can see the vastness of the ocean behind them. So in all these ways, what visuals do is what rhetorical critics would call is they give presence to words. That is they give an added vividness to what the, the speaker is saying. And they also can serve to reinforce those words. Now, we continue to see this even today you know, with other presidents. Uh, when the RNC ended you know, this summer, uh, you, you may not have, have liked to hear a lot of people, you say, well, that was illegal because the Hatch Act makes it illegal. It happened anyway. That is true. But my point would be, look at the visuals, right? If you're already an incumbent president, you know, you've got the White House behind you, all of the flags, and they also make sure that even if you're too far away to really see the president speak, they've got the screens. So again, it can, it can reinforce that sort of uh, a visual. And on social media as well. So just from a couple of days ago. Uh, talking about the fact that Justice Amy Coney Barrett had been, uh, you know, had gone through the, the Senate confirmation. And when you look at the colors, you know, that, that are there, it's, I don't think, an accident in terms of, you know, what he's wearing in terms of the colors, how they go nicely with the flags that are hanging there and so on. And again, it seems to convey patriotism, but also that he got the job done. This is what a lot of his supporters wanted, and he was able to do it. Another theme that we see uh, with presidential rhetoric for the last, I would say, 40 years and continuing is a focus on ceremonial rhetoric. I have to go back to Aristotle for just a moment. Um, Aristotle talked about three different kinds of rhetoric. He talked about forensic rhetoric, which focused on past, the past and on fact. So did this murder take place? Is this person, in fact, guilty of said crime? also talked about deliberative rhetoric or policy rhetoric, which was focused on the future, which is what would be the consequences of this course of action if we were to follow it. The type of rhetoric that didn't get much attention was epideictic rhetoric or ceremonial rhetoric. And it was focused on this particular moment. And what it does is it reinforces or praises values the audience already believes in, or it condemns values that the audience opposes, or it may praise or condemn people who seem to exemplify you know, those values. So the kinds of examples we typically think of are things such as eulogies, inaugural addresses, uh, ribbon cutting ceremonies, uh, commemorations, uh, graduation speeches, that type of thing. And the settings in ceremonial uh, you know, speaking for presidential speech rather really seem to have increased and I first you know, saw this when I was looking at uh, Rod Hart, University of Texas, did a study quite a bit ago where he found that presidents from Kennedy through Reagan were speaking in ceremonial settings twice as often as Truman and Eisenhower did. But I started noticing that this trend seemed to be continuing. And part of that, it seemed to me, was that we seem to have a greater need for comfort from the president in times of crisis. 
So after 9-11, everyone remembers, you know, George W. Bush going down to ground zero and, and, and talking about how the people who, who did this terrible act would soon be hearing from us and that he heard the pain of the people who were there. Uh, earlier, Bill Clinton with the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the Challenger explosion with Ronald Reagan, again, one of his you know, most famous speeches, Barack Obama and his eulogy for the teacher and the children killed at Sandy Hook Elementary. And just think about the number of mass shootings where President Obama in particular you know, spoke. You know, there are so, so many. I've always been somebody who uh, I actually have a, a soft spot in my heart for ceremonial speech and, and maybe because I'm a teacher for commencement addresses. Um, in terms of commencement addresses, I kept thinking, wow, it seems like presidents are doing a whole lot more commencement speeches than they used to. So I started keeping track and I found in fact that was the case. If you look here in blue, you'll see the number of commencement speeches that they're giving in general. And you'll see in red, the total number of commencement addresses given at military academies. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, Johnson kind of pops up a little bit, but then things are again, fairly stable until we get to George H.W. Uh, Bush where ceremonial rhetoric gets even higher than it was well, with Ronald Reagan. And then Clinton and George W. Bush and Obama even more so, so many commencement speeches. A couple of interest uh, points here. One is that Clinton and Bush were the two who gave an exceptionally large number of speeches at military academies when there was not really a huge precedent for that prior to that. And I find it fascinating that the two people who had the most questions raised about their military service or lack thereof were the two who felt the need to go to military academies you know, to you know, do this commencement speech. It then became sort of a settled expectation, right? So Obama, every year and, and Trump too. You, you give one commencement address at a military academy every year. If you'll notice, President Trump is, Trump is not particularly interested in commencement addresses. He's given the smallest number. So just five altogether and four of those were the ones that you expect at military uh, academies. But that's not to say that he is not interested in ceremonial rhetoric. <sighs> It's kind of an interesting thing. He continued to give these rallies even after he was in office, but they ceased really to be deliberative, detail about policy of any kind or what he was going to do, but they became more about praise and blame, uh, praise for him, blame for anybody he disagreed with. And it's, it's interesting because it makes him a little different than other presidents, like a lot different actually, is that when other presidents engage in ceremonial rhetoric, they usually talk about values that unite them with all of the American people. And if they do attack others, it might be as George W. Bush did, an enemy who has done us harm. But President Trump tends to separate those people he believes support him from those who he believes do not support him in his praise and blame. And that's quite different you know, because he's separating Americans in terms of how he talks about all of this. So one of the questions that people ask me is, you know, isn't, I mean, ceremonial rhetoric is kind of fluff, right? Why do we really even want to pay that much attention to it? And I would just say that there are a number of really interesting things that ceremonial rhetoric does. You know, one thing is that it reinforces uh, values that are held in common and it brings unity. Typically, again, you know, with American people as a whole, in the case of President Trump, it brings unity with his supporters, right? And it does you know, reinforce that relationship that they have and the values that they hold. Uh, epideictic rhetoric can also serve to enhance image. Certainly that is true for him with his most ardent supporters. But with other presidents, when they engage in a ceremony where they're you know, talking about you know, particular values that the audience as a whole you know, really holds dear, uh, they kind of bask in the glow of those shared values. So it can be beneficial for them in that way. Ceremonial rhetoric also can pave the way for deliberative or policy rhetoric. Uh, as you know, one example, I would point to George H.W. Bush, who gave ceremonial speeches, including in his inaugural, you know, where he talked about the thousand points of light, but he praised values that you know, people would say are important, you know, having a sense of duty to others, sacrifice, you know, commitment, um, you know, being patriotic, pitching in and helping others. No one's going to say, I'm totally against helping other people. I'm not for commitment. <laughs> you know, those are things he reinforced, 
But because he talked about them in the context of us as individuals, he paved the way for his policy rhetoric, which was going to tell us the government is going to do less because the expectation is, is that we as individual citizens are going to do more. Another thing to take into account with ceremonial rhetoric is that ceremonial rhetoric can also be used for purposes that maybe are not so good. And that is, and I'm picking on, on George W. Bush here, but he's not the only one, uh, that quite often uh, presidents, if they are having difficulty in some other aspect of their presidency, will shift to ceremonial rhetoric in these safe surroundings. Uh, when the Iraq war wasn't going so well, George W. Bush started giving speeches before very friendly audiences and he liked military audiences. And you look at this, the beautiful visage behind him, again, the visuals tie in with the ceremonial, right? You've got the bunting, you have all of the sailors at North Island wearing their dress uniform. And no one is going to interrupt him. That's a nice thing. It is rude for reporters to interrupt a, re a president when it is a ceremony. So you don't have to answer those tough questions. And he had the band playing, you know, hail to the chief and all this sorts of things. So it can deflect criticism. It can deflect criticism and can be a way to avoid having to answer, you know, questions. Despite the fact that it can be used as all rhetoric can for good or for ill, I really believe ceremonial rhetoric can do wonderful things for us as citizens. And that is that at its very best, what ceremonial rhetoric does is it's reflective, it's introspective. It gets us at its best to rethink the way we see things uh, and, and to have a new lens on old values. So at American University in 1963, John Kennedy gave the commencement speech there and we had gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis the year before uh, we had almost, you know, had a situation where we were at nuclear war, but uh, here he realized we, we need to come to some type of agreement. We need to, this, you know, nuclear test ban treaty was what he had in mind, but he used this opportunity to try to praise values that we might hold in common and to rehumanize the Soviets. We may have our differences, but they were our allies and, and they lost so much during World War II, just as we did. And they love their children just as we do. And they we breathe the same air. So that, again, helped pave the way for deliberative rhetoric that, that was good, right? Barack Obama at Charleston in 2015, I think, is another really impressive example of this. Uh, this is at the eulogy for Reverend Clementa Pickney. Uh, he and some of his parishioners uh, were killed by a white supremacist who, who had joined their prayer group in their church. And in this particular speech, what he does is he depicts not, don't let me just share the black experience, but the black experience is the American experience. They are one and the same. And he brings in things about the black church to help us to see grace as having an open heart, again, toward that consistent and you know, persistent push he always has to, to more, move toward a more perfect union, right? By looking at how racism affects things individually, but also systemically. And that was something he always had to be so careful to talk about, but here he let it go. And, and, and again, I got so many Americans to see things in, in a different light. So we've got the visuals and ceremonial rhetoric, uh, something that is not perhaps quite as uh, pleasant <laughs> is that we have fragmented media, which are leading to fragmented realities. And that is both in terms of how presidential rhetoric is used and the way in which you know, it, it is covered. So let me talk about this for a little bit. Media deregulation in the 1980s uh, came along and prior to that, radio and television, because they used airwaves, the Federal Communication Commission would regulate them tightly and say, you're a public service. So as news, you need to cover both sides of an issue. And we know that even that is uh, a little disingenuous because you know, there might be more than you know, two sides. But nonetheless, there was this idea that the news was important. But uh, with deregulation, because cable came along, the idea was, hey, you know, if you want to see a different perspective, you can go almost anywhere and, and be exposed to all sorts of different perspectives. At the same time, cable posed greater competition to the network news. So it was cutting into their profit margin. And we also have at the time, the start of an evolution of greater expectation of returns for stockholders. And so all of this serves to diminish the status of news as a public service and instead, it enhances its entertainment value instead. 
CNN and the 24-hour news cycle started in 1980, followed by Fox News and MSNBC in 1996. And with that 24 hour news cycle, you sometimes hear politicians kind of disparaging and say, oh, you got to feed the media. Well, in a weird sense, although that terminology may be uh, you know, somewhat you know, indelicate, there's certain truth to that, which is that if you don't have a message that particular day as an administration to provide your message of the day to keep on top of things, then somebody else is perfectly happy to fill the vacuum and to give their perspective on what you're doing, which may not be at all the perspective that you would like them uh, to share. And so as, as a result, you know, you've got more things going on. And one of the questions I always ask is, is there really so many things in the United States in 24 hours that need to be covered? And there might be, but really what we get are bursts of news and then anything they can do to keep you watching. Talk shows, pundits, talking heads but not comprehensive news of other things that are typically not covered, nor of news going on in other countries that might be really important for us you know, to know about. So all of, these, uh, all of this you know, is, is problematic because two, it adds to the idea that with cable and then the advent of the internet, citizens have many choices about what they can watch, right? So uh, you can choose if you want to, uh, to, to not watch the president when the president gives a State of the Union address. Uh, you know, a lot of you who are older, you, know, you might have had three networks when you were growing up. And if you were watching TV when the president was on, on, on TV that night, that's what you were going to be seeing because there were no other choices. Um, and now, you know, you could watch football. You could do the Home and Garden Channel. You could do whatever you want to do. You could play Candy Crush, but you don't have to. So what that means is that Americans don't share this broad-based perception of reality. You can avoid politics altogether, or you can decide to kind of stay in your tribe by staying with Fox News or staying with MSNBC or the internet you know, kind of parallels. And at the same time that all this space was opening up on TV, the length of sound bites were getting shorter and shorter. And part of that uh, was probably because they're trying to fit in more commercials. But part of it also uh, is that they're trying to keep your attention. And it, they, you might get bored if it's a longer. So we keep making it shorter and shorter and shorter. That can be problematic because, again, you know, it's how can you convey an argument that is very complex in eight seconds? So that has had an impact too. And then we have the rise um, of the inter internet in, to a greater degree, right? First White House website is in 1994. And it's a, a public relations tool of sorts. And Barack Obama's you know, presidential campaign in 2008, heavily relying on Facebook and social media. And this continued in 2012 with both campaigns being very involved. As you can see here though, uh, the Obama campaign did a much better job than the Romney campaign of engaging, partly because they'd been at it longer. But also uh, he had a digital media team that was small, I think, as I recall, there were maybe five people and a translator. Uh, but because the person who was in charge of it was somebody who'd had uh, ties uh, to the campaign for a long time, the people working there, they had a lot of autonomy because they knew that the media messages on social media would be consistent with what the president was saying, which means they could very quickly turn around. The Romney team had 16 people, but they had to go through all these different layers to get things approved. And that meant that they ended up just having snippets of things from press releases that wasn't very well crafted you know, to social media. But the point here is the social media was really here to stay. And in 2014, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to this, but President Obama on a number of occasions appeared on social media outlets. And what had happened here was that the rollout for the Affordable Care Act had been a bit of a disaster. Uh, because the computer system wasn't working well, as you may recall. So uh, they brought in tech people to correct it. But when it got time for enrollment deadlines, they still didn't have enough people. They needed more people to sign up. And so what they decided to do was to go onto this satirical program on Funny or Die. And they would make the pitch for this, you know, signing up for health care through this, because this was something very popular with young people. And in fact, after he appeared, there was a huge number of people who were visiting uh, the Affordable Care Act's website 
And 90% of them were people who had not been there before. So this ended up being highly effective. Plus they get a lot of free media coverage from people who were um, you know, seeing that this was funny, right? You know, so just got regular news coverage as well. In 2015, uh, he had his own uh, personal presidential Twitter account. And of course, we all know what's coming. It, it brings us here. And uh, President Trump used Twitter uh, you know, to, as a way to work around the media, right? To talk directly to people uh, so often was a part of his. Uh, a recent uh, tweet, I think, kind of summarizes where we are right now. And again, talking in ways that are so different than most presidents in the past would talk, whether in so, you know, social media with Barack Obama or elsewhere. You know, the fake news media writing COVID, losers. You, doesn't sound like the way we usually expect presidents uh, to talk. And so there are a lot of different functions of Twitter. Twitter shapes news coverage because journalists are on Twitter. And so during debates, for example, each side tries to give as much positive coverage to people responding to, hey, this is our guy's doing well, or our woman's doing great in this debate as a way to influence the type of coverage about who's winning or losing. And of course, President Trump has done that just in terms of driving the news coverage with his controversial statements. Um, in addition to that, um, it's a way to attack and to respond to attacks. It also can reinforce more formal messages, and it can also be a way to make targeted appeals. So as an example, this happened in the vice presidential debate. I think probably everyone here, uh, you may be political nerds and remember this. And shortly after, this happened. This is a great example of how Twitter can be used so successfully. You've got concise, pitch in $5 to help this campaign fly. The double entendre is humorous. The fly swatter is humorous. And they've provided a link. And so with social media, it's got to be timely. It's got to be fast. And if this is great because if people are looking at this and they're funny and they're feeling good about the debate, you want to hit them up now and you want to make it easy by putting that link there. So you've got to be nimble uh, if you're doing this. But at the same time, uh, Twitter has some negative consequences too. Uh, its simplicity is one of its beauties, but is also one of its drawbacks. 280 characters, although you can send subsequent you know, tweets. But if you are combating somebody who is engaging in simplicity and actually the issue is very complex and you've got to present a more complex argument, it's difficult to do. It's difficult to do. Uh, it encourages impulsivity and it encourages incivility. There have actually, has actually been research that shows that people are more impulsive and more incivil on Twitter than they are on other uh, types of social media. And particularly if they use Twitter on their phone as opposed to on their computer. And then lastly, I just wanna to point to how fragmented media and realities are exacerbated by a lack of civic knowledge. Uh, this Take the Quiz is from 2011, but all the other ones are from more recent years, 2019, 2020, and so on. And uh, the answer to the question, how ignorant are Americans, is unfortunately, it seems like pretty ignorant, right? Uh, the Annenberg Public Policy Center in 2016 found that only 26% of Americans could name all three branches of government. And that was down from 38% in 2011. And 40% of participants in the study thought the Constitution uh, would allow them, uh, Congress, to outlaw journalists from reporting on any issue of national security without getting government approval. There was another study that was from a US citizenship test, and only one in three could get a passing score of 60% or higher on the quiz. And despite that, we're seeing this onslaught of Dunning-Kruger, and some of you may have heard of this, right? Dunning-Kruger is the idea that uh, despite low levels of knowledge, people frequently exemplify high degrees of confidence, even though they don't really know very much. And 89% of Americans in one test of this uh, took a test on civics and they expressed confidence that they had passed and actually 83% had failed. So we seem to be having a little bit of that, you may have noticed sometimes in public when it comes to people very confident that they understand you know, the science or how health issues work, but yet they really don't. And so that is, is pretty difficult. So with fractured media leading to these fractured re realities and polarization, right? This is also impacting presidential rhetoric because if you have to try to talk to all of these folks, 
Um, what are the common premises that you can count on them filling in? You know, for those of you who took a rhetoric class, enthymemes, right? How do we actually do that? And so that I would say is probably the biggest challenge that faces uh, the, the presidency when it comes to rhetoric and uniting the country in the future. So I wanted to give you just a little bit of a sense of some of the trends that I'm seeing. And, and like your mother, I'm putting my email address for some of you that I haven't heard from in a while. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen then and so that uh, we can open it up for questions and comments from you. Well, great. Well, let's get started here. Um, I saw some comments and questions come in. So I'd like to turn it over first to Ellie, um, who put in a comment pretty early on, um, and we will get this discussion rolling. Okay. Thank you. That was a one that was a excellent summary of what the trouble oh. we're in. I was wondering why it shouldn't be a, a necessity for anybody running for any political office to take uh, courses in, in um, you know, general ed from the College of Worcester and like institutions, <laughs> and especially to understand the difference between ethos, legos, pathos, those, you know, the basic tools of rhetoric. What are we, what are we attempting to do in this speech? Because every time Trump gives a speech, it gives a rally, he calls it a speech, but it's not, it's a rant. Uh -huh. And, you know, a speech would have some knowledge of whether you're aiming for feeling or logic or, or you know, better ethos. So I wonder if you could talk about that. Well, gosh, I'd love to make it so that all presidents had to be from the College of Worcester. I think we would be in favor of that. Um, I think the part I, I definitely uh, I agree is that I think um, what we're really seeing is uh, civics critical thinking. And of course, we're all biased, but I, I do think, you know, a liberal arts education that's more all encompassing is, is just very, very helpful. Uh, there are probably lots of reasons why we're, we're lagging in some ways now when it comes to civics knowledge and, and, and part of that. And it probably has to do with the fact that we have all these choices, so you don't have to pay attention to politics if you don't want to. But it's also the case that a number of, of, of experts on both sides of the political aisle are, are pointing to uh, how we are, have really let down um, our, our students, you know, and, and by that they mean just you know, American kids, in terms of our civics education. About half of the states don't have any accountability for teaching civics uh, to their elementary, middle school, high school kids. And it turns out that the, if you are in a more affluent school district, you're more likely to be exposed to those ideas. So that means then that um, if you are somebody who comes from a disadvantaged school to begin with, you might be even less likely to know how to operate as a citizen, what the rules are, how the government works, or even what I've really found a lot of too is how to vote. Voting is very complicated. But over time, I'm finding an awful lot of students even coming here who don't really understand uh, a lot about how government works because they just haven't had much in the way of coursework uh, with it uh, in high school. Okay, next, uh, we will turn it over to John with a question about commencement speeches. Yeah, hi. Uh, just I was wondering, uh, you, you noted that the uh, number of commencement speeches went way up uh, during a period. I was wondering if you had any sense of to the cause of that, whether that was the president's choosing to just give a lot more, or if maybe there was, you know, kind of this realization among universities that, uh, you know, hey, we can request a president to come and, you know, they actually show up. Like, do you have a sense of who is driving that, uh, that increase? I think there probably are a lot of different factors. Um, I think that some you know, some presidents just find it to be a very pleasant kind of experience, right? People are excited to see you. You can go to places where they don't typically see a president, so it's you know kind of exciting to to be able to. People are waving and happy, you know, no matter what you say, probably you know just because you know you, you were there. Um, also, in in some cases, uh, I think John Kennedy, and this is you know, back earlier. But I think Barack Obama and he share this uh, basic predisposition that they like to think and to reflect. 
And that kind of setting provides the perfect place for it because it's, it's an educational setting, right? And you have perf you know, free leeway over what it is that you choose to talk about uh, as long as it somehow falls within the parameters and you thank the graduates and congratulate them at some point along the way. I, I really think though, in terms of reaction to your question though, with the military academies, I just can't help but think that for uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, that that wasn't part a way to kind of burnish, you know, the weaknesses sometimes perceived uh, in their their own uh, personas, or to go back to to ethos as Ellie was talking about, you know, earlier. That's where they were somewhat susceptible. And then with George W. Bush, he was also during war. You know, it it, it kind of makes sense maybe that he would continue to do that. What'll be interesting, John, is to see whether that, ha you know, um, someday when President Trump is out of office, what will happen with that? You know, because he's marked a difference, right? You know, because he hasn't done that. So will it go back to that? Or will it, it stay? I mean, I think there's a, there are a lot of unknowns. I mean, he's definitely going to have an impact, but, but what it exactly it is, we don't know yet, I don't think. Okay, Lauren sent me a question uh, for me to ask on her behalf. Um, she asks, do you think it's possible for a president to go back to the unifying rhetoric of the traditional presidency? Um, she's thinking of the inaugural genre in a post Donald Trump era. Oh, in the inaugural address, I think uh, that yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that that will, you know, in a, in a post Donald Trump presidency, I think that will happen because I think there is there, to every reaction, there's a counter reaction. And so I think one, his, his polarization that he's, you know, we've already had a polarized uh, polity, but then on top of that, you know, he's made it even more polarized. And so I think that when he is not there, there's just going to be a great thirst to have more unifying type of, of rhetoric. To the what What he has done in terms of um, separating out, you know, that state didn't support me and you know, not wanting to give aid. That's just so completely aberrant that, yes, I think there'll be a correction. How long, you know, it, but I will say one, one last thing is that how long that can continue in this polarized atmosphere, that's going to be the, the hard part, right? Because there are going to be some people from the very start who are going to reject uh, some of the efforts to reach out. And next we will go to Sue. I, 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 you may be mean me, I don't know. Um, I, I wonder what your opinion is about the president's tweets. I'm incredulous thinking about him typing his own tweets. Do you think he does? Yes, I do. That he does. I, I, I'm having a little bit of trouble. I'm going to try to turn this up a little bit. A little trouble uh, hearing you. But you, you were saying, do, does he? Do I think he tweet? He types his own tweets. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah. Yes. I, 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 they're, they're not, not always. I mean, there, there are some, and during the campaign, there, you know, he has other people who do some of that too. But he definitely is doing a lot of it himself. Yes. You think he's doing it on a phone? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm just incredulous. His thumbing of tweet. Yeah, it is. It's it's been pretty strange. I would agree. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it's uh, the the thing that's really weird though is that for you know some people, I mean, I, my, some of my students have you know asked me. They said, "Is this the way it's always been?" Right? Oh my Think goodness. about that, right? Because yeah. our seniors, this is what they have known for four years, and so. If you came of political age in this time period, and especially with all the other polarization, you know, some people are going, "Is this the way politics is? Right? Is this? Is are these the only options you know that we have?" So yeah. Well, do you think you think future presidents will utilize tweet Twitter the same way? I think Twitter will end up still being used, but um, my guess is uh, perhaps more judiciously. Thank you. Yeah. It looks like um, Carol agrees that he does uh, also type his own tweets. Um, and next we will move on to Alex who has a personal question for you. Uh, 
Hi, everybody. Um, this is Alex Jew, class of 2010. Um, Professor Bostorf, I was just curious um, uh -huh. what your favorite political button on your wall is. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and why, and just the story behind how you got it, because you have quite the collection. Mm, I, I do. Curiosity. Um, let me think for a minute. Okay, so I, I have many enablers. Uh, many of the things behind me uh, are things that family members, students, former students, friends, colleagues, you know, find and or, or seek out and, and get me. Uh, probably one of my favorites, I think, is just because you have to understand a little bit, we talk about enthymeme, where you have to fill in the missing premise. So I have a button that says, Jane Wyman was right. So some of you are smiling and some of you are going, huh, right? So Jane Wyman was Ronald Reagan's first wife. And um, a student happened to be someplace, and I had, you know, we'd somehow been talking at the background. This has been a while, obviously, about uh, Ronald Reagan. And someone came in, she was a waitress, and was wearing that button. And they said, "Could I have that button for my professor?" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that, so that, Alex, I think would be my my favorite, both speak, both because of how it came to me, but also just because I find it fun, just because it's it's like a little inside joke kind of thing. Great, thank you. Uh huh. So next, we'll turn it over to Frank, who has um, uh, an anecdotal, uh, uh, I guess, example to share, and then a question. Okay. Hi. Um, so the anecdotal thing is, um, uh, when I was in high school, I'm from the class of 66, so I'm okay. an old guy. When I was in high school, um, in New York, the state of New York, they had new uh, voting machines. And the high school students actually went through practice sessions on using the voting machines, even though it was going to be years before they would have an opportunity that's to actually use them. And I think that's probably unheard of these days. Yeah. Um, my question is, do you see any way, or do you see ways to use social media to break down rather than build up barriers between diverse socio-political communities? Mm -hmm. I think that there are times when that does happen. And I think that uh, if we look at the reactions to George Floyd's death this summer, that we saw that, uh, where people you know, because there was so much coverage and it started showing up on all sorts of different social media threads that uh, people got introduced to new perspectives if that, if, if, uh, if that issue was, was new to them. So I think that it can happen. Uh, and the, the one other thing I would say that social media can sometimes do is that um, it can share stories in a way that stirs pathos. And, uh, and again, you know, I, I was going back to the question that was asked initially about ethos, pathos, logos, right? So, you know, ethos, credibility, pathos, emotion, you know, logos, reason. And even though we often will say, we just want reason. If you think about it, you wouldn't really want a leader who has only made decisions based simply on logic. Uh, it would kind of be like, I don't know, Mr. Spock being in charge of everything. And while very smart, you know, there are times when empathy and compassion um, are in order. We also know from research in psychology, for example, that um, emotion is a component of all persuasion. So the only way, I mean, somebody might be convinced by your arguments about why they should vote for someone or why they should support a particular issue. They might say yes, but they won't actually do anything about it unless they feel some tug of emotion that makes them feel it's relevant to them or important to somebody else or uh, in keeping with their principles so they have to be impelled to do it. So that's why, um, I guess it's also partly why I, I do, I like ceremonial rhetoric because I think it has that, can have that balance of, you know, inspiration and so on. And social media does allow sharing of stories. And so there have been a lot of people who I think 
through that have, have been exposed to other perspectives. But the difficulty is, is that of course, we tend to be lined up in our tribes more or less and not to uh, follow things that we know we are going to disagree with. And that's what makes it hard. Yeah, that's, that's actually why I asked my question because Floyd George situation was one in which there was such an impelling graphic mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. that it cross cut all of the communities and some level. Right. And it was a sort of a ground truth. And right now, things are so divergent that what constitutes truth even differs among it is. these groups. Yeah, I know. I, I, I agree. And, and there have been other times in, in, in the past I don't know if you remember when there were the, the protests in Tehran and there was the young woman you know, who was killed and that was sort of captured on video and it went all the way around the world. And there were protests all around the world supporting you know, the, the supporters. And so in that sense, social media allows organization and, and, and can allow us to learn about issues that we might not otherwise know about in a good way. But those very same things, you know, can be used for all the negative, all the bad purposes too. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Next, we will um, turn it over to John again, who has um, another question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so this kind of comes from a roommate, housemate of mine. <laughs> who holds that, uh, you know, Trump's kind of a social engineer. And I was curious about it. Uh, so he notes that uh, Trump will make tweets every so often that contain a number of typos, and then these get undue attention, let's say, from the media. And so he thinks that that is an intentional, perhaps, way of drawing uh, eyes to uh, to issues that he cares about. And I, as someone who's actually studying this, I was curious what your observations are, if you think that's just a side effect of those being probably the handcrafted tweets as opposed to the uh, curated ones. I think it's just a side effect, honestly. I, you know, it, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, he, he has in a, a very much an intuitive sense of how to provoke, right? Uh, and so, that, that is there, I think, always. Um, but in terms of the typos and things, no, I don't think it's planned out at all. There's just been, there's just, it's just too many things, too many places. Um, yeah, so that would be my opinion. All right, next we'll hear from Judy, um, who has a thought about the tweets and also a question. Judy, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, we will try to come back to Judy in a moment here. Okay. Um, but I did get a question from Dee Dee. Um, she says, can you speak to the language that the Trump campaign uses in its fundraising outreach? Um, she says there's so much anger and pressure to join his campaign. Yeah. Um, yes, I've been receiving his fundraising messages, uh, emails from the beginning. I mean, the, right after he became president, I started getting them. And sometimes I just, I get tired of looking at them and I, and I just file them away. And other times I'm just, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, draw, you know, you see a, a car accident, you can't help but look, even though you know you shouldn't. So they're interesting. I, I, to me, what they remind me of are the hard sales tactic, right? Because it's always, this is an exclusive offer. It's only going to be here for a short time. We have this special, and it might be a doormat, an autographed photograph, or some such thing, is, is an exclusive offer only for you, and it will only be here for a very short time. Uh, this summer, I received uh, an email telling me that if I responded right away, like in the outside, it said he attached his convention address and wanted my feedback. And I thought, well, gosh, how nice. 
<laughs> but there was no speech actually attached. So a lot of times he'll say he has these things, you know, uh, attached plans or this kind of thing that he would like us, you know, to to, to look at. So um, interestingly, I had a reporter ask me about this, and anyway, she said she had done some investigation and had found that the people who are creating his fundraising messages are using the booklets that they use to train people for Trump University, to sell Trump University. And they said, uh, a lot of the advice that they give is very much along the lines of the things I was noticing, making you feel like you're exclusive, you are special, the high pressure sales tactic, you better do it now because it's only gonna last a short period of time. Uh, so it was interesting that that is apparently the, the framework that they're using. So that's most definitely why you're seeing the high pressure. The anger, um, that has always been there. This is something I've actually been doing quite a lot of work on. Um, one of the things that we find, you know, anger can be a motivating force in politics. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, it can be you know, anger for social change that is needed, right? So, you know, somebody mentioned about Black Lives Matter. You know, it can function in, in that way too. Um, but his campaign rhetoric has from the very beginning, some people would say fear. I think it's much more anger. And so I think that what he does is he legitimizes the anger that a lot of people are feeling. Um, early on, the, some of the arguments were that uh, the people who were following him were people who were most economically uh, you know, harmed you know, by economic changes of the last whatever. There's a little bit of truth to that in that you can correlate economic changes with a uh, sense of anger, but it's uh, this anger among you know, primarily white men and also what's interesting is that in 2016, Trump's supporters were far more affluent than Clinton supporters. So you can't explain that just by saying it's economics. I think it has more to do with cultural changes. And so you add economics on top of cultural changes. Uh, we've had a lot of history of this in, in our country at the turn of the 20th century, uh, when, you know, uh, at that time, almost any you know, white male could go out and be an entrepreneur and be successful, own their own business and all those types of things. And suddenly, you know, we, their corporations monopolies started happening then and that became harder to do. And there was this blowback where a question about masculinity, you know, things became, uh, they kind of went for a more primitive form of masculinity. That's when boxing became very popular and bodybuilding became really popular. And a lot of civic organizations for men only popped up. And there was also a lot of animosity because even you know white working class women or white upper class middle class women in particular were asking for the right to vote and asking to be have be into in professions. So I think you see the same thing happening in this time period from the 1980s on through the present. And as our you know, culture has gotten more diverse, right? We have more and more people, you know, a bigger percentage of the population from minorities. And, and women in the, in the workforce and in other areas, you know, there is a bit of a blowback, I think. Uh, it's interesting that some of the research that has shown that there were two uh, issues that could most predict um, a, a support for Donald Trump. One was racism and the other was hostile sexism. And they also found that in, some, in an experiment in political psychology, that if you could prime people to feel anger if they, adopt, if they were somebody who adopted already what was called more an honor culture of masculinity, right? If they were primed to feel anger, they were much more likely to follow through on voting for Donald Trump. So all these little pieces kind of add up to anger and that it's not just about economics, that it's really, I think, about cultural changes and, and, the, and the, the response to that. That would be my take. Great. Next, we will move on to Lucinda. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, the question I posed was whether or not you predict that there will ever be, be a return to the time when we didn't hear from our president every day about something, regardless of whether or not it was an issue or a situation that day that really called for his input comment on position or the like? I don't know. Um, I could see where we might return to a day where we didn't hear quite as much, but because of that news cycle, there's always has to be some type of 
you know, unless it's you know, like Christmas or something. I mean, there's just some kind of message, right? Focus, you know, in terms of what's going on. Sometimes it can be downplaying. Like if you look at crisis rhetoric, there are some occasions where presidents will downplay what is going on and simply talk about, you know, they're taking, you know, you know, meeting with you know people from the Pentagon or this or that. And so, but still, you're still hearing what they're doing though. So. In that sense, I don't know that that will ever really go away. Um, I did happen to see, I'm not able to follow the, the, the chat, um, but I saw, and, just, and I, know, I know Lauren, the, the 1968 redux, she said in terms of um, you know, uh, what we're experiencing you know, now. And uh, Lucinda, we didn't hear from presidents quite as often then as we do now. I think we will continue to. But uh, this idea of 1968 is interesting too, because I'm, I'm teaching a first year seminar uh, this semester. Uh, it's a, a different twist on something I taught five years ago, uh, looking at the rhetoric of the Vietnam War era. I have felt for the last few years, like we're living 1968 through 1970 all over again. And so my first year seminar is looking at the rhetoric of polarization. And so we're going back and forth between looking at Vietnam and looking at what's currently going on because we have all the issues of race. Instead of a war, we have a pandemic. Uh, we have polarization that is huge. And so it's, it's been really interesting uh, to both see the current through, their, through the students' eyes as well as to kind of share with them earlier and for them to make those connections. I mean, even think about, um, and again, you've got some of the same people, right? Roger Stone was around in the Nixon era and he's around now. And so President Trump using this language, the silent majority, that is vintage Richard Nixon, right? So uh, there is this weird way in which it seems circular. Well, thank you for pointing out why the time period seems so familiar because I was on I was on the college campus from the fall of 1967 ah. to, to I finished three weeks after Kent State. Okay, yeah, yeah. That has been the one unfortunate thing because of the pandemic, la the last group of students, we actually went on a trip to Kent State. And so we weren't able to do that. But yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. Yeah. Okay, and next we will hear from Holly. Hi there. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about, you know, I, I wasn't surprised by the data about the lack of people's understanding about civics. I, I do a lot of advocacy work around early childhood and I'm amazed at that people don't even know about term limits or, you know, the three legged stool of government, you know, all of yeah. those things. Um, I, I just am seeing talking about polarization, it's fascinating to me about how people are not using critical thinking any longer. And it seems like it's being sparked by the Trump administration and the rhetoric of fake news, that everything is now fake news if it doesn't align with what you believe um, so deeply. The, and I, I guess I'm wondering, like, how do we get ourselves back to critical thinking? I literally was helping moderate an event locally with the League of Women Voters, and a candidate said that education was his top priority, and that like in China, where we they indoctrinate children to love communism, that here in the United States, we should be indoctrinating children to love mm -hmm. the United States. And that, of course, I, I had to really hold my face, you know, like, what? Uh -huh. So that's what we want is a bunch of sheep um, and, and children that don't ask questions or have critical thinking. So I think fake news has now become the thing that everybody says, like, if it's not what I believe, fake. how do we get ourselves back from that? Yeah. And, and it, actually thinking. Yeah, I mean, well, the yeah, the damage uh, to uh, any credibility for the media. I mean, of, of course, you know, we all know there are times, you know, when news media have been their own worst enemy occasionally because of this rush to be first and all the competition, people make mistakes. And because the budgets have been cut, you know, sometimes there's not the as, as in-depth reporting as, you know, would be would be good. But um, he has consistently undermined. He's been very honest about how he and why he does that. You know, I forget who it was who asked him. It might have been Leslie Stahl, but why do you? Because then they won't listen to you, right? 
And, uh, and it's very true. And now others around the world are picking that up. I think that um, we need to have in the schools you know, more attention paid to critical thinking, to civics, and to media literacy. And, we, and there has to be support for teachers to give that broad-based critical thinking because sometimes the perception is going to be like you just said, oh yes, we'll teach civics, but it's gonna be everything my country does or my government does you know, is right. Unless it turns out it turns out to be something I guess I don't agree with then all that's bad, who, depending on who's in office, right? That we really need that for the betterment of the country. And it's civically, we need that. But if you think about it, you know, even for those who are just drawn by economically how, do you, you want people who are critical thinkers uh, working for you, don't you? You don't want somebody who's just a drone who doesn't think about how this change you know, has an implication down the road for, for this other thing. Uh, so that's part of it. I, I, I sometimes wondered if maybe the No Child Left Behind, while very well intentioned, has put a lot of emphasis on reading and math, but I know sometimes what's gone then instead has been, you know, things like history classes or the, the government classes or the extra sorts of things. And a lot also too, our emphasis on tests has kind of encouraged sometimes the more rote sort of learning as opposed to the creative critical kind of learning. And so I don't know how we do all that, um, you know, trying to support school board members who will support teachers to do that, I suppose, is, is, one, is one, one way. But I agree with you. I, I, it really, really is needed. I mean, if, you're, if you ever have a jury deciding your fate, don't you want people who are critical thinkers making those decisions? You know, don't you want your representative, whether locally or you know, nationally, being somebody who's smart and savvy and yeah. I wish I had a more positive. This isn't so easy. Uh, next, we will turn it over to David Lohr. Hey, Dave. Dave, you should be unmuted now and able to ask your question. Okay, well, I will ask uh, the question then. Um, David asks, is Trump a master communicator who knows exactly what he's doing, uh, deplorable as it may be? Uh, is there thought and strategy to this or is he just um, an idiot who realized people like the stupid way he talks and types? Um, I tend to think, okay, so, all right. So sometimes there's strategy in the sense of you know, uh, Steve Bannon and some of the folks working with him will, you know, think ahead to different things that he can do. Um, if you, you may remember four years ago at the presidential debate, uh, right before it, he had the, the three women who had accused Bill Clinton of, of sexual assault and one woman who had been a child rape victim who's, uh, when Hillary Clinton was a public defender, she had uh, defended the, the person accused of committing the crime. And he had them in a live Facebook event and then was going to have them walk into the debate uh, and confront Clinton on stage. So the, the people running the debate figured that out. And so they said, no, you can't do that. But they did still sit in the ticketed row. And they tried to do something similar to that with the whole you know, uh, Hunter Biden thing the other night, but it just didn't quite you know, work. So sometimes there is strategy. But I think most of the time, he's just sort of, uh, I mean, an intuitive demagogue, to be honest. I mean, I just think that uh, he gets the crowd reaction and he just, he just goes with it. I, 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 you know, I don't think that there's a great deal of thought. I mean, and if, if, there, if there were some really long-term strategy to everything he does, then he probably wouldn't put in tweet form some of the things that have been used or they're trying to use as legal evidence against him, you know, right, in, tra in charges against him. So I, I tend to think it's just kind of as he's going for a lot of that. Uh, 
Okay, and um, next we'll hear from Molly. I assume you mean me, Molly Moreland Myers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Thanks for Professor Brostorf. It's so good to see you. It's nice to see you. Um, so I remember back in 2000, we talked a lot about the rhetoric of hate groups and how they would, you know, gather their new followers, even in online, even in, you know, the babyhood of the internet. Mm -hmm. And I've just been thinking about how 20 years later, what that's like now, and with a president who seems to even advocate for some of these hate groups and are you still looking at that online and seeing what they're doing to get new followers? Yeah, I, ha I actually have not. I'm, I haven't been following that as much in terms of studying it and so mm -hmm. on, but I certainly take notice uh, of yeah. the things that I, that I do see. Um, yeah, I, I don't, and again, I don't know that it's necessarily the case that uh, Donald Trump is uh, someone who loves the hate groups, but I think that he just can't bear to uh, and it's, it's so funny because he doesn't have trouble being mean to other people, but he can't bear to be mean to people who he thinks love him. Uh, and so whenever push comes to shove, he just can't bring himself really to to back off from that. Right. Yeah, but it does. It certainly has uh, legitimized because uh, you know what, how they're interpreting it. You know, the the Proud Boys mm -hmm. certainly you know interpreted it as being all you have to do is kind of look at some of their feeds. Sure. He's giving them he's giving them permission to go out and be violent. Right. And Charlottesville. I mean, that we're, we live an hour and a half from Charlottesville and I just that pops in my head all the time. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, again, been a real divergence from, you know, the recent past. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We've got um, one final question from Karen. Um, who says, do you think that Trump's election in 2016 was an anomaly or an almost inevitable result of our divided political system? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that Trump's rhetoric will become the new norm? Oh, <laughs> well, that's depressing. I thought I was being depressing. We hope not. Um, <laughs> well, on the one hand, the whole issue with the Electoral College versus the popular vote that was probably something, again, just waiting to happen because it's happened before. And there was a time, uh, you know, Birch Bay of Indiana at one time was really advocating for uh, putting an end to that I mean, decades ago. And there was actually bipartisan support, but eventually because of some political interests uh, were not served by it, it didn't come through. And now, uh, I mean, people are not going to budge, right? The, the Republicans see it so much from the larger rural, you know, more red states see it so much in their favor to keep this current system as it is. And of course the Democrats and the, and the more blue oriented states see it as something they wanna get rid of. So I don't think, think that means nothing's gonna happen with that. So we could see a situation like that again. In terms of the rhetoric, it's gonna be with us here for a while at least. And the question is, uh, I, I think really what happens in the next few years. Um, I wish I could predict, I really can't. Um, I know that one thing I worry a lot about is that um, even whether it's four years or eight years from now, when President Trump, you know, or four, year, four years from now or a few months from now, I should say, that uh, President Trump leaves office, there is, as you said, there's this legacy of all this that we've had for the last four years. And also the people who have most ardently supported him and his own self-interest and, and promotion. So those are not gonna go away immediately, right? Instead, they're just gonna take up refuge someplace else. And that could be a Trump TV, that could be Fox News, various places on the internet, uh, so I, what I fear is that there's going to be like the new opposition, right? And so we'll have the same kind of thing going on uh, and that will make it difficult. Now, I, I think what, what we also see, though, is that there are a lot of people who may not necessarily be uh, huge uh, Joe Biden fans originally in terms of his policy and so on, and people who are just not all that uh, political generally, but they're just, they're tired, right? The, the, the chaos and 
you know, the events and the drama of Donald Trump can be really interesting. You know, you just can't keep your eyes off of it sometimes, but after a while, it's really exhausting. And so I think that there are people who, and that's part of uh, Joe Biden's appeal, I think, for many is just that it's different. It's calming. The fact that he's, you know, maybe seems boring is actually a pleasant change, right? But will he be able to unite people? That's, that's kind of the question. And, you know, or uh, unite enough people, you know, to, to bring a semblance uh, of normalcy back. I don't know. Well, on that note, um, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, and to give my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Bostor for joining us uh, and Aww. sharing her expertise in what um, has to be one of the busiest times of her life thus far. So thank you so much. Um, and of course, I want to remind all of you to vote. Uh, if you haven't returned your mail-in or absentee ballot, make sure to just drive it right over to your nearest Dropbox and put it in there yourself so we know that it arrives on time. Thank yes. you so much and have a lovely night, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. And it's so nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Take care, everyone. Yep. <laughs>